Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Royal Society of Victoria, to our Ellery Theatre, and to those of you online on uh, on the Zoom webinar, and also we're also being live streamed on YouTube. So welcome to everybody. I'm really looking forward to tonight. Uh, before we begin, though, uh, we must acknowledge that all of us in Australia are located on the traditional lands of this continent's first scientists, many different na First Nations peoples who belong to the diverse lands and waters of this remarkable region of our planet. We're coming to you tonight from Melbourne uh, and Port Phillip, a region called Nam, by the peoples of the Kulin Nation, who have lived with this, in this country for tens of thousands of years. Uh, we're sp specifically located on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung, uh, people, this land never ceded. I invite anyone joining us tonight, either via the Zoom's webinar chat function or on the YouTube comments section, uh, for those of you on, on the live stream, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of your own local country and join me in paying respects uh, to their elders past and present. And we likewise extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who have joined us in the meeting tonight. I'd like to offer a particular welcome to our colleagues uh, and friends from the Victorian Division of the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, and also to the Science Teachers Association of Victoria, uh, with whom the Royal Society is partnering uh, to present this joint event tonight. And thanks in particular to uh, Professor, Professor Matthew Kutzbitzen uh, and Alexandra Abela, a bailer, I try, we've been, I've been practicing, for your, it's important, isn't it, Alex? It's good yeah. for your and for both uh, in your efforts in helping bring tonight's program together. We have an excellent evening ahead of us. Uh, some outstanding scholars, school leaders, educators, and policy leaders in the room to share their perspectives and to discuss a brighter future of what all our organisations consider to be a profession of foundational importance to the entire scientific ecosystem. Hopefully everyone is aware now that the Victorian government has removed one of the economic barriers to seeking a teaching qualification this year, this being university fees. It's now free to get your teaching degree. So a brief, as I did, uh, a long, 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 long time ago. Uh, so briefly going wider than that, uh, than just science teaching, uh, we know there is something of a crisis in the teaching profession as a whole, as with other callings like healthcare, we tend to take this workforce for granted and the sector as a whole seems to be perpetually stretched to the limits of its capabilities. I was just saying to Amanda and Jan, my, I've just come back from Sydney this afternoon where my, my son, the actor, is completing his B.Ed. And I can't wait to get into the workforce. He's still got a few hurdles to jump and he's doing it part-time and it's pretty hard when you're trying to earn a, earn a living as an actor. But we'll get there. Uh, because I, because um, New South Wales, like Victoria, calling out for great teachers. Uh, when we get an additional uh, shock or stressor, like a pandemic, as we've had, and I know there are plenty of people wearing masks here in the room tonight, and there's COVID all around us. I know our uh, CEO, Mike, uh, Mike Flatley, is recovering, uh, managed to, we had a big uh, forest symposium here last Friday for two days, and he and a couple of others managed to uh, get COVID on that day, I think. I managed to avoid it, thank goodness, but there are others all around us, there's quite a quite a spike and there'll be someone here who might make some comments later about that. Uh, anyway, um, we have many systems that are chronically overloaded. Uh, things start to break when that, ha when that happens, systems, processes, and most importantly, people. Understandably, it's getting harder and harder to attract talented graduates to our teaching professions. I think we all know it's not just a matter of covering the university training fees, however welcome that measure is. Whilst we, we absolutely wish to see our teachers not just surviving but thriving in their practice, we must also keep in mind that a profession in crisis cannot adequately serve the needs of the students that our culture has a duty to foster into adulthood as a next generation of Australian citizens, professionals and leaders. So to begin, we have two speakers tonight. I'm really going to let them to leave them to their own devices about how they organise that. They'll be joined by two panellists uh, following those presentations. 
Let me introduce you to both of our speakers and let them uh, run the tag team. Firstly, Professor Amanda Barry. Uh, Amanda is Professor of STEM Education and the Associate Dean of Research and Innovation in the School of Education at RMIT University. Amanda's research focuses on how science teachers develop and refine their professional knowledge and how that knowledge can be communicated in ways that build a strong future science teaching workforce and inspire students' interest, engagement and success in science. Amanda has led numerous projects at state, national and international levels focusing on innovations in science teaching and learning and the development of teacher knowledge and practice. Please make Amanda welcome. Please come up, Amanda. Uh, next, let me introduce Professor Jan van Driel. Uh, Jan is Professor of Science Education in the Faculty of Education at the University of Melbourne, where he co-leads the Mathematics, Science and Technology Education Group. His re research is on the intersection of science education and teacher education. Based on the notion that teachers have a strong influence on students' performance and aspirations, he aims to understand how science teachers' practices are shaped by their professional knowledge and beliefs, and how these practice, practices impact on students. Specifically, he's interested in how science teachers adapt their teaching to address different learning needs and interests among their students. Please welcome Jan. Um, I think I'm just going to, you, you two, and then uh, our other panellists, I think we'll just let you do your thing and then have a good conversation later is probably the best thing to do. I'll leave it, leave it to your own devices. Excellent. Thanks, Rob, and thanks for that great introduction. And, yeah, Jan and I will be tag-teaming. We've been encouraged to even do a high-five when we um, tag-team here through the different parts of this talk. So, yes, welcome, everybody. Thanks for those people who are online. Um, great that you're joining us and the people in the room, too. We're really thrilled for the opportunity to be able to talk about this important topic um, together and have the collective wisdom in the room as well. Our sponsors, also Alex and Brendan, who'll be joining in the conversation and the wisdom and experience that I know that people have in the room. After all, everybody's probably been to school here. You've had experiences of science teachers and you have views, I'm sure, that can help inform the discussion that we have later as well. And I'd also like to make an acknowledgement of country at this moment. Rob talked about um, this place, Nam, Melbourne, where we are. And I'm not sure if um, people know already, but there's the five language groups of the Kulin Nation. Um, these shields represent these different um, language groups. And you can see them along Birong Ma, they're Yarra. Um, and a really nice way to be able to represent symbolically those language groups. And that notion of Nam as a meeting place, I think, is also really important as we think about coming here for an important meeting tonight and the RSV as being a site where important meetings take place. So um, the topic of this talk here, the idea of aiming higher in science education, um, already suggests that we're not aiming high enough. And when you have a look at the media reports, it's pretty easy to do a quick Google search on science teaching or science education. And most the things that pop up are not a pretty picture of how um, science, science education, science participation is being represented in the media. So STEM enrolments hitting a 20 year low, there's problems with teacher shortage, and that has an impact on kids' learning in maths and science. There's problems with the science curriculum. There's problems with the ways in which the science is being taught, which should be teaching in different ways, and generally about what's compulsory or not compulsory in the curriculum. So what we want to do together is um, unpack those issues, talk about them, and then um, have some opportunities to have some discussion with you about that. And we'll do it through these themes of um, what we have um, located in the media and obviously what we know from our own research and practice and experience as well. Um, and so for those of you who'd like advanced organisers, here is one and it'll help with keep us on track as well. And we'll go in and out um, of these different topics. So connecting in with those ideas of participation, who enrolls in especially senior science and maths, and what does that mean in terms of who's in and who's out? Um, what do we know about school science education and curriculum problems, but also some solutions? And thinking about science teachers, generally about the teaching workforce and how they're represented, um, and finishing on a positive note about conclusions and ways forward. So 
section one, this is me, participation. Now, I'm maybe quite difficult for some of you to see um, this graph, so I'll talk it through. And it comes from um, a very interesting source of data, national um, data from the STEM Equity Monitor. And if we're talking about the numbers of students who are participating in senior science, so this is about enrolment in year 12, equivalent year 12 um, subjects in science. And what we've done is um, group those different areas in terms of, uh, well, you can see there's agriculture, biology, chemistry, earth science, physics, um, and even it's a little bit hard for me to see what the other one is, but generally in that area of sciences. And one of the issues that comes up is around like who's participating. And I think um, when you look at this data, the purple is girls and the green is boys. And you can see from that a little enrollment graph there in terms of percent of all enrollments, if we're looking generally across science, there's slightly more girls studying science than there are boys. And that trend seems to have stayed <laughs> More or less even, it's increased a little bit um, over the years with those graphs beginning at 2013 and going through to 2021. So that presents you know, a reasonably positive picture, I think, in terms of the ways in which that gender divide um, is apparent. However, when we start to pull apart, and I'm sure there's people in the room here and online who say, yep, I know these kinds of things already, but it's just interesting to set the scene in this way in terms of those three traditional areas of senior science of biology, chemistry, and the equity monitor puts physics and astronomy together. So astronomy would be a very small number of students and physics is as well. So if you can actually um, see those numbers, the greatest number of enrolments in a science subject of those three is biology, followed by chemistry, and unsurprisingly, the lowest there in terms of um, physics and astronomy. By far, the proportion of biology students are girls, and that is a trend that has continued over time and is in fact um, increasing. And then in terms of chemical sciences, so chemistry, there's um, been a slight increase in the number of girls who are studying it, but generally that's about a 50-50. And then when we look at the very different situation in terms of physics and astronomy, we can see there's a 24% proportion of girls who were studying um, physics compared with boys. So these are people who are enrolled in year 12 subjects in that area. So just reinforcing that idea of like since that period of 2013 up to 221, there hasn't been a lot of change in those three different subject areas. Okay, and then this data comes from the Australian Mathematical Sciences Institute, publishing about mathematics participation. Um, there's a lot more data available than this, but we pulled out a couple of um, graphs to have a look at in terms of the higher levels of maths. So that um, higher maths, as in specialist maths, you could equivalent, uh, that it's equivalent and intermediate uh, around maths method. And again, um, looking at gender there and the distribution. Not only that, but also thinking about percentage rates of participation um, of those students in those areas too. So um, you'll see participation rates of students in intermediate and high maths has been declining over time. The last decade, actually male participation has been decreasing more than female. So we've got a narrowing of the gender gap, but probably not in the way that we would uh, be like to see. And again, higher maths, lowest proportion of girls out of all the maths levels. So unfortunately, not um, painting a particularly um, good picture, unless um, we're thinking about biology there, uh, in terms of the participation in those kinds of sciences. So how do we think about this kind of data? What, what are some of the reasons behind this data and how do we start to unpick it in terms of um, influences on participation? Um, I have a colleague, Grant Cooper, who I did some work with looking at uh, data from the longitudinal surveys of Australian youth. So it was about 4,500 um, 4, students and we we're looking at relationships between different demographic factors and participation or enrolment in um, science subjects. And strikingly, um, and again, this might not surprise some people, that socioeconomic status was a big predictor of students' participation in senior science subjects. 
So as SES um, increased, so did students' participation, both boys and girls, in biology, chemistry and physics. So I'm just focusing on the sciences now. Um, we also found that in terms of Indigenous participation was a negative predictor in biology, physics and chemistry, but not in Earth-space sciences. Now, um, I know that um, different states offer environmental Earth sciences um, and there's generally quite sort of low-ish numbers compared with the other, um, with the other um, discipline areas. But it was interesting to find that there's no significant differences when we look at um, Indigenous students studying those compared with um, the other subjects and gender being a significant predictor as we just saw in those graphs. So hmm, when we think about SES, what does that mean? Uh, socioeconomic status, there's no conclusive evidence that tells us the reasons why that SES and um, participation in science might have that relationship that we saw. However, we can speculate on some things. For example, if you have parents with um, higher SES, they may well have higher levels of professional qualification and as a consequence may have higher aspirations for their, uh, their children in relation to studying these perhaps um, more attractive subjects in terms of status. Parents may have, well, resources, so there's a conducive space for a student to study, um, access to coaching, access to um, extra opportunities for schooling, those kinds of things that come along um, with um, having those resources, those extra like, cultural, economic, social resources that can boost opportunities for children's learning. Um, some speculations around what might it mean uh, for Indigenous students, perhaps perhaps because of the earth and space science having a, a stronger connection to land and sea that might have some influence on people's interest and, um, and um, decision to enrol in those kinds of subjects. It may well be access as well, of course. And uh, those messages about gender, we know come pretty strong and early about who should be participating in science and maths and particular kinds of science. I hope you're not getting too depressed. We will get to the good part <laughs> while we start to tell some more positive stories. So, um, of course, these factors don't operate in isolation necessarily. Um, they can come together in something that we would call um, intersectionality, and those effects of those factors can be multiplied. So um, colleagues who are looking at um, education participation generally talk about those issues, particularly for boys in terms of SES, and um, somewhat different for females. But if you think about locality, poverty, um, your cultural status, um, and access to schooling can lead to the multiplication and amplification of ways in which children's access to schooling and good quality education can be reduced. And you know, there are things that you can't change about demographics, obviously, but there are things that we think can be changed. And, in the paper that Grant and I um, published, we said that students' demographics shouldn't be predictors of their science participation to the extent that they do. So we need to think about the ways in which what is available to students in higher um, SES might also be available and the kinds of ways in which we construct and imagine the curriculum that suits some kind of students compared with other kinds of students as well. What else influences many other things, and I've just chosen um, three here um, to talk about. And this is a familiar one, I'm sure, to many people who are here um, online and um, in the room. The ATAR is a game for a lot of students in terms of which subjects to teach to maximise their study scores to get into particular university um, uh, co courses. And depending on the university course, the requirements may not be for specialist maths or physics. So um, there's a quote here that I pulled out from a student who said, <clears throat> might as well do Australian history because I might get a better chance of getting a higher, math, a higher mark even though I like physics. So there's that whole pressure around the ATAR and the ways in which students talk about the perceived difficulty of subjects and whether or not you can get a high study score whether they're myths or realities, that's something that we can talk about as well. Um, but that obviously has an influence on participation. And those things press down from senior school into middle and junior school, which we can talk about as well. 
Science identity is also really important in terms of how do I see myself as a science person? And children get messages pretty early on in life about whether or not they are seeing themselves or as others see them as science people. Uh, <clears throat> I recently had a conversation with somebody who had taken their child up to um, the careers night and um, this child was interested in engineering and um, the careers teacher, well-meaning I'm sure, said, I don't think you would like to do that, it's a really dirty job. So... Um, <laughs> That's uh, pressure on, you know, who am I and how do I fit into this kind of world? And those messages come not only, obviously, from careers teachers, but families, they're cultural, they come from society, etc. And this was an interesting um, bit of extra information that we located around COVID-19, that it seems to have a, actually a positive impact on people's perceptions of scientists during all that great work in immunology, for example. And um, according to these data, what... Uh, more likely to consider um, future work in STEM. Uh, so participation is one thing, choosing to participate in one of these science or math subjects, but also interest is another driver. And you just saw that quote from the student who was interested in physics but chose something else. And I find the diagram up here um, quite alarming when we have a look at the ways in which interest in maths and science declines over time, and it doesn't start very high. In year four, liking maths, 37%. I, I uh, have been going into primary schools for research projects that I've been doing where seven-year-old girls are telling me I'm not good at maths, and I think, how did you get that message so early in your life? And moving up to year eight, 13% of students, this is girls and boys, talking about their um, lack of interest, uninterested in um, maths. And then um, liking science, well, it's a little bit more hopeful there, um, but again, declining over time. So important to think about those kinds of factors that might be influencing that. And now here's the part where I go like this to Jan. And, uh... <laughs> oh, and you need this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mandy. Um, yes, I'll, I'll um, talk a little bit we're focusing now from in this part of the talk on, on what's happening in school science education uh, in Australia and Victoria, but also um, a bit of a global uh, perspective. Because um, if you look at it very roughly, very broadly, uh, internationally, um, one of the things, of course, that is very typical of science and, and probably quite unique compared to other school subjects is the enormous amount of knowledge that has been produced in science in the last 100 years, 150 years, and is continue be, to be produced on a daily basis. So if you compare that with, if you look at timetables across the world, we teach like 30 hours per week. There's so many hours for, for science. If the, the, the timetables from 1900 show maybe three hours science per year uh, for year nine or year 10, and we still have three hours uh, or around that for, for science in year nine of year 10. Uh, maybe four, maybe it can vary a little bit, but what I'm trying to say is, with in, a, in, in the same amount of time, we need to cover an enormous amount of knowledge. And that is, of course, impossible. So what has happened is that over time, the, the, the topics that were in the science curriculum around 1900, and I did, when I did my PhD, I analyzed some of those older curricula back in the Netherlands where I'm from. And you look at the curriculum now, you look at, for instance, I was, I was as a um, as a former chemistry teacher, interested to see what is happening in VCE and chemistry in Victoria. I recognize all the topics that I did when I did my year 12 in, in, in the 1970s, and when I was a chemistry teacher in the 1980s. They're still there, all of them. And of course, there's lots, there's, there's still assets and bases and what have you. And still, and of course, there's new topics added to that, uh, more recent topics. There's nanomaterials, uh, to name just one. Um, so it's, you can only do that if you, if, if, yeah, if you have the same amount of time, you have to reduce the amount of time that you spend on each topic. So it has to become more superficial and it has to become quicker. And some, some colleagues use the, the, the phrase like an, um, a mile wide and an inch deep. So that is a dilemma. And again, that's of course not unique to Australia. That, that's, that's, that's because science is producing so much knowledge. What, it also, uh, what you also see in curriculum around the world is that um, even though we have science here in year 710, 
there's difference between schools, but most schools would still teach, you know, biology in, in term one or, or physics in term two as separate subjects. So the cohesion between the science subjects is not optimal, I would say, and even within some science subjects, uh, you could say that topics are de um, uh, dealt with in, in, as if they are these discrete units with not, many, with not much connections between them. And, and of course, the last bullet is related to the, uh, that overloading of the curriculum. If you have very little time, the, the most efficient way to do it is to explain things as quickly as you can and then get students to, to, to do a, maybe a, a couple of practicum uh, or experiments. And um, the traditional ways of teaching and assessment uh, are still very clearly present in, in classrooms around the world. This is a slightly different way to look at more or less the same issue. Um, the focus on textbooks, again, that varies from school to school or country to country, but in, in the Netherlands where I taught, textbooks were very dominant, very guiding in what teachers were doing, maintaining, as I said, separate uh, disciplines. And the role of experiments was, and this was even disappointing when I was a chemistry teacher, and I thought, we do experiments so that kids can understand how scientists discover knowledge. But I was very disappointed when very early on one of the kids said, Mister, what are we supposed to see? It's like... No, I'm not telling, <laughs> but the way that experiments are integrated or, or um, conducted in, in a lot of science classes is to basically confirm or illustrate what was already explained uh, prior to that. So in a very, in a way that is, could still be uh, uh, helpful, but not true to the nature of science, of course. I've already mentioned assessment, and that leads to students experience, uh, experiencing a low tolerance of failure. If you make a mistake or if you give the wrong answer, you get a low mark, so you better be, be careful. And even the last button, uh, the last bullet, um, just to illustrate, um, teachers would use a hook or something that students are familiar with to start the uh, introduction of a new topic. Uh, for instance, you could talk about the battery in, a, in an electric car or in an iPhone. But within one lesson, typically what you see is they're doing the old-fashioned electrochemistry with the galvanic cells as they've always had. And, and so that hook doesn't really drive the interest of, of, um, of the students for a long while. So what that means for students is that a lot of students perceive science as being difficult um, and stressful because there's a risk that you score low. Um, there's a fear of failure. And it's often, and again, this is not unique to Australia, often reported in many studies that students don't see what the relevance is for science in, for their world or for their future or in the world that they live. And that leads to attitudes and interest, as we just saw already. Interest declines over time, as we saw in, in um, one of the last slides, and attitudes being really problematic. Um, one of my PhD, current PhD students is looking, she's defined the notion of science well-being so what, what, is, what does well-being in a science classroom look like? And she has done a study with year eight students here, a couple of hundred students that she surveyed, and it turns out that these students value to understanding of science, but very strongly connected to, um, to having fun, to, to um, having a strong relationship with their teacher. So that cluster that needs, that needs to be combined for them to, to um, uh, keep their interest going and also their performance. We, we're not talking all, so much about um, um, performance today in, in our talk, uh, but of course we, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the PISA dates, the PISA data, um, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later on, but if you look at the PISA data and you can see that you probably will remember that the scores in Australia are trending downwards in the, since 2006, but if you look at it more closely, for instance, through an SES lens, you'll see that the, the students in the top 25% of SES score way above the, the OECD average and are probably up on the top of the world. But it's the students at the low, the low 20, the lowest 25% of SES. There is an enormous gap. The only good news is that when you look at the data is that over time, the gap has become slightly smaller, but the trends is downwards. Talking about the OECD and, and the next uh, PISA, um, it should have been out already, but it, uh, it was delayed because COVID happened. And so what the OECD decided while they were working on the new PISA framework to 
in the middle of COVID to survey teachers, science teachers from around the world. So they got responses from about 400 people from 22 countries. And they asked them, for instance, what is the core purpose according to you? Number one is inspiring students, inspiring learners to engage with science. That is first and foremost what, all, what the science teachers from all over the world reported. They, al they also asked them, what do you think of the current science curriculum in your context, in your country? And the majority, two thirds, said, well, it's, it's, it works. It, it helps to enable young people to become scientifically literate. But looking to the future, that was another question. They disagreed. Uh, in fact, only a third agreed that the current science curriculum, their current science curriculum, is fit for the future. So what did they mention? If you rank the recommendations that these 400 teachers gave um, in the top four, this is, this is what it looks like. Uh, more focus on practical skills, um, reviewing the existing curriculum in keeping with what I just said, make sure that the content is up to date and that the amount of content is, um, is, needs to be reduced to, to, to allow for more depth of learning. Um, look at ways to connect the content, the, the science that we're teaching in the classroom with what's happening outside the classroom and also that uh, element of assessment and examination. As I said, COVID happened. And one of the things that was already happening before COVID, but was of course exacerbated by COVID, was the spread of misinformation, especially misinformation about science. We all remember the nonsense that was in the media uh, uh, and, and, and of course continues to be in the media. That led uh, a group um, of co scholars, colleagues from Stanford University, led by Jonathan Osborne, to um, to look into that whole um, notion of spreading of misinformation from the point of view, what does that mean for science education? What does that mean that we need to do when we look at our curriculum and what we're doing in science education? Um, and they said, well, we actually rarely <coughs> teach students um, how, the, the, how, how they can understand the, um, the knowledge that is produced, whether that can be trusted. And it's a fact that students get their information, the overwhelming majority of their information, not from science teachers, not from textbooks, but they get it from the internet, they get it from social media, and increasingly through AI, of course. So they, they may be digitally very capable, but they are novices when it comes to evaluating the information that they encounter, the information about science, but of course also other information. So that leads to this group and this report, and I think it's, it's a really important and interesting report to read, to see, like, shouldn't we address how expertise, how, how, how they can uh, recognize expertise, how they know whether somebody who's interviewed is an expert on that topic. Um, that person may be a Nobel Prize winner in a particular area, but if they, if they talk about a completely different area, they are not trustworthy, as, as, as their title may suggest. Um, how, how the process of knowledge production takes place, how scientific consensus, the peer review process, all those aspects of the scientific knowledge production process that um, need to be highlighted maybe much more than, than we currently do. And that of course also uh, creates almost a natural connection, stronger connection with mathematics, um, not maybe the traditional algebra, but ideas like probability, sampling, modeling. So some really good food for thought about what that means for the science that we teach and how we teach it. And that's where I give it back to Mandy. Great, thank you. Okay, so Jan was framing some of the problems in relation to um, science education, and I'm going to talk about over time some of the solutions, some of the approaches that have been used in order to address the issues that he's raised around um, authenticity and meaningfulness, etc. So I'm going to talk about some pedagogical approaches and also some curriculum approaches. And in terms of pedagogy, um, different kinds of approaches to teaching and learning have been introduced in a way to try to engage and interest and motivate students' learning um, about science. Um, for example, around the 70s and 80s, um, introducing those ideas around conceptual change. So acknowledging that students come into our classes with ideas already about science, which may or may not align with commonly accepted scientific views, and that we need to start where those children are and 
present um, scenarios, present situations that cause them to start to wonder and question about their own views and ideally start to realign their views with something more scientifically acceptable. So that's been an important influence on the way in which science teaching has developed over time. Also, we've seen the increasing use of um, different sorts of inquiry-based, project-based, contact-based, you can see they're design-based. So approaches that enable students to start framing problems and with scaffolds of support, being able to investigate those problems, learn different kinds of skills, so that instead of having the facts laid out in front of them, they have an opportunity to be learning as they go and to be able to look at those in relation to real-world problems, for example, um, and authentic situations situations maybe for their community or their school or um, thinking about something larger than in terms of um, global issues, for example. More recently, we're seeing more technology-enhanced ways of pedagogy that are entering into classrooms and schools. And um, I'm not talking so much about online learning here, but think about simulations, um, uh, gaming that's come in, um, different kind of AV, um, AR type um, ways in which we can immerse ourselves in different worlds and start to explore those. So that's increasingly having an effect on the ways in which the pedagogies take place and also importantly in terms of how teachers think about what it is that they're doing with their students to help to be able to engage them, not only engage them in the sense of having a good time, but engaging them cognitively, mentally in what they're doing and learning. So um, other solutions, and same with pedagogy internationally, there have been different ways in which curricular interventions have been introduced to try to um, bring science more into a contemporary science content. And we can see in the Australian curriculum, for example, there's examples of more um, contemporary forms of science content, looking at climate change, for example, now biomedical technology. But we're also talking about things that are right on cutting edge frontier kind of science, um, where the science isn't actually quite known yet that is being introduced into schools. And we've noted some really interesting work that's been going on with a few of the centres of excellence, for example, that's the Einstein First Project in Western Australia that's developing Einsteinian physics for um, primary and secondary students and working with schools around that. I know that Jan's involved with a dark matter lab um, in Stahl where they're doing some really interesting work and thinking about how that can be connected up with um, students um, learning in terms of that like not yet known science, um, frontier science. And um, I've working with colleagues at RMIT around microcomb technology and they're trying to help people understand what it is and how um, more people can know that it's important in terms of future energy sources. So there's these ways in which we're bringing these different things into the science content um, and modernising it in, um, for students. Also that focus change where we used to imagine when um, science students were coming in that they were all budding scientists and the rest of the people don't matter in our science classes. Um, that idea fortunately is changing or has changed. So that notion of why people are in your class for learning science is about developing their capacity to be um, able to make good decisions, to think about the sorts of things that Jan just talked about, to critically evaluate what they see in the world around them and to appreciate science. And I um, note here the very strong work of Peter Fencham, a late emeritus professor Peter Fencham, who was an advocate of that science for all and saying that even if we want people to become scientists in the future, our curriculum should be a science for all curriculum. And it doesn't disadvantage those people who are going on to further study in science to have that kind of curriculum. Um, again, the ways in which um, schools and education centres can connect with different informal science um, opportunities through museums, zoos, science centres. We've got um, brilliant science and math centres. We've got our tech schools in Victoria. We're incredibly lucky for the uniqueness of having both these science and math centres and also for the tech schools and what they are able to offer that perhaps the resources um, of schools just cannot do. 
Um, and increasingly, we're seeing more interdisciplinary or integrated approaches being um, introduced into schools, for example, through integrated STEM education or at least different subjects being brought together in a way that helps students see holistically what does an issue look like? Because as Jan uh, mentioned before, you know, we tend to pull these apart and only think about them in as a discrete subject area, whereas in fact, in real life, these are all connected and need to think about the connected and the different kinds of expertise that comes together to understand and make sense of that connectedness. Um, so, yeah, STEM education has really grown a lot in popularity in schools. Um, it's interesting to think about the different sorts of influences on what STEM education means. Clearly, there was a push, political, economic push. We need more people to be doing so, um, senior science courses. We need more people to be graduating with science degrees. Um, but there's also a, another and maybe parallel, maybe sometimes contrasting view about actually it's about giving students the opportunity to have a good educational experience of understanding the world around them through a STEM lens, not necessarily just pushing through the so-called pipeline of um, further careers. So um, often it gets associated with this development of these different kinds of skills and abilities that has not been traditionally part of a science curriculum. And um, I've seen quite fascinating through schools, different ways of profiling themselves through STEM, either trying to get more um, students in because they're saying they're a STEM school or using particular equipment or just actually embracing the idea that there's something really important and good we can do for our students. Um, while there are ideas across the Australian and Victorian curriculum about how to bring STEM in, there's actually no formal STEM curriculum. And I've said here it's both a blessing and a curse because as you walk into schools, you see that teachers get really excited about being able to develop their own curriculum that is responsive to the locality in which they are, the students' needs, what the parents, maybe the skills that they can bring in, what's in the community. And at the same time, then a thousand flowers are blooming because STEM looks incredibly different in different places and not necessarily then being able to bring forward the kinds of aspects of STEM learning that we might say go with science, maths, technology, engineering. It tends to look more like a smoothie as everything gets blended together. And um, there's limited teacher professional learning um, in STEM. I know there's lots of great things out there, but compared with what um, else is on offer, it's limited. Um, so I'm going to put a series of quotes up here and you may not be able to read them very well, but um, I'm going to share with you some research that I've done with um, colleagues and we invited teachers in Victorian schools who were said that they were doing integrated STEM in their school to talk with us about why did you choose to do it and um, how do you design a STEM curriculum, what happens when you put it into practice and um, how do other people in your school think about that. And what has it done for you? So um, reasons to introduce STEM here. And um, well, the first quote there talks about how nice it is to be able to be flexible and not to be stuck within the rigid disciplinary boundaries of the traditional science curriculum. So that sense of flexibility is there for this teacher. And then um, the other two quotes relate to the ways in which students were responding to the maths and science curriculum. And um, so this teacher's saying, the students had no sense of meaning of what they were doing in my classes. And to tell you the truth, that's really disheartening. And that was relating to science and maths classes. And then engaging kids in maths and science so that they don't think it's boring, which is what I was being told by my year nine students, particularly the girls. So interesting reasons there in terms of um, bringing STEM in as a flexible, responsive, more engaging way to teach uh, what it is that the teachers were interested to explore with their students. However, while some colleagues thought this was brilliant and there was some really great work that was going on collaborating with teachers, there was also quite a bit of pushback from other teachers as well. So especially um, science teachers didn't want to give up any of their hours for teaching STEM and they've always taught science this way, so why should it change? STEM's a waste of time. And then the other thing that came through very strongly was 
But if you're going to be teaching the separate disciplines in year 12, why, and year 11, why would you be doing integrated STEM in seven to 10? You're just disadvantaging the students and the teachers in the senior school are not interested. Now, we had more examples of people who thought about clever ways of integrating those ideas into um, leading into senior school, but you see, this is some of the um, issues that they're encountering. However, despite those challenges, they persisted and saw benefits. And one teacher talked about strengthening her own approaches to teaching and learning because she saw that she was listening to the students more instead of feeling constrained by the curriculum, which I think was really interesting. And other people liked really called the collaboration aspect that wasn't part of what they were doing before and the impact on students. Students can make an impact or make a change. So, all right, that's the end of my section and you're back on again. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so focusing on the role of teachers, the role of science teachers, um, following up basically on what Mandy was just saying. And just a warning that it, it's going to get a lot a, a bit negative, but it will, it will become more positive a bit later. Um, just before we focus on science teachers, uh, just a very brief global overview of, of teaching as a profession. So around the world, there's an estimate of about 80 million people are employed as teachers and another 68 to join by 2030. In Australia, I, I did an estimate based on information from the government. We have around 400,000 teachers in primary, early childhood and secondary education. In the US, what is important here for this is, is the, the, the studies from different countries, the US, the UK and Australia, and all of them have in common that a large number, in, in fact, the majority of, of teachers experience their work as very stressful and, um, and, uh, and come with mental health issues. Um, and the last uh, uh, um, information on this slide I think is particularly worrying if you see that the, 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 the percentage of pe teachers in Australia that plan to leave or consider to leave the profession uh, was already very high in 2019 and is a lot higher even then. So whether or, you know, you can only imagine what COVID did to that, but it's, that's, that's a big worry, of course. Of, hope, of course, not all those 74% will actually leave teaching, but the fact that they are considering is, is I think, is worrying enough. So if you look, and it was, still we're talking about teachers more broadly, um, that's a very bad photocopy of a, a, a letter in the age last Saturday, but I thought it was very appropriate for what we're talking about today. Um, there are a lot of issues and barriers. There may be uh, teacher shortages and it may be we all say well that should be easy for teachers to find jobs but a lot of those jobs are not for a long time teachers get contracts for a short period of time and after at the end of the contract if the hours are not there they may have to move on and that's what also this person in the letter writes about and of course and that's a given fact and again not unique to Australia if unemployment is low overall people are not they have more other opportunities than science teachers typically have, have good opportunities on the labor market. Um, the moment uh, an, an employment rates go up, we see numbers of students in teacher education uh, increasing. It's a, it's a happened since the 1950s or 60s and maybe even before. Workload or work-life balance maybe is a better issue. Uh, teachers don't mind work, working hard, that's not the issue, but they also have a life, they also have caring duties, etc., etc. And workload, as you could remember from the last slide, is a big issue. Um, and all of you who work in schools will have their uh, examples. The rigid systems, many already alluded to that, um, combined with a lack of autonomy, the feeling that you have to do all these things that your school or the government has, does, uh, wants you to do, and that there is, that could be the curriculum, but that could also be related to all sorts of accountability, all sorts of reports that need to be written in administrative work. For me, and this is a personal note, the fact that government schools require teachers to write the learning intentions and the success criteria for each lesson on the board up front is like it's like what it's like a TV series where in each episode starts with a number of spoilers. That, that if you want to inspire students, that's not what we should be doing. But this is my personal view. <laughs> and of course, lack of support is another thing that often comes up in reports why teachers are burned out or want to leave support, lack of support from their principals or lack of recognition, but also support of parents is missing and increasingly problematic. That parents are very critical, which of course they're entitled to, but not also very supportive as you would like them to be. Well, 
Nicole Mottler is a colleague from the University of Sydney, and she did a very interesting study, I think. She analyzed no less than 65 news articles from the last 25 years from the 12 leading Australian newspapers, and she selected every article that had the word teacher more than three times. Her analysis shows that the way that teachers that be, are being represented in, those, in, those, um, uh, in the media, in those newspapers, uh, is overwhelmingly negative. As a, a fixation on teacher quality, um, there is a, a representation where teachers' work is made to be, look very simple, which it isn't, and I'll talk about that very soon, and there's a lot of negativity around teachers. Oftentimes, and she found a strong correlation between these negative reports and reports that featured um, politicians or government um, people who, who were talking about teachers. So there's has a, a very, and this quote from Nicole, I think is, is uh, well, speaks for itself. Uh, but if, if this is the way that teachers are talked about in the media, you can understand, you can imagine that that's not a very attractive for people who want to become teachers, but also who are already are teachers. It's not new to, to talk negatively about teachers or about science teachers. These are just some from old headlines from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But what is different, and that's why we put this up, is it's about science teaching and not about the teachers. So what, especially those new paper articles where politicians or government people are talking, they seem, in, that's Nicole's analysis, which with, I agree, is they they blame people who are not doing a good enough job as in basically avoiding to admit that the system needs uh, is, is, is problematic. And so if we look at good teaching, what does that actually mean? Of course, there's been more than a century of research on what makes a teacher effective or what makes a teacher an expert teacher. And that is partly on science teaching, but of course also on other teachers. But if you look at it uh, of the qualities and the characteristics that make a teacher effective, um, from a subject matter perspective, so teaching particular content like science, then I can summarize, that's what I try to do, I summarize all that research in like these four, 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 four dot bullet, bullet points, sorry. Um, the first one speaks for itself, but it's not evident. Not every science teacher understands their subject matter thoroughly or thoroughly enough. But it's like a prerequisite to do the other things, because you need to do, you need to be more than that. It's not, and this is, goes back to that media. Oh, if people know their physics, they can be good physics teachers. No, I'm kidding you. No, really. No. They need to know how students learn the subject matter and how students sometimes struggle to learn the subject matter or what makes it interesting or less interesting for them. And knowing that, they need to have a repertoire of strategies that they can draw on to actually help and promote student learning. And those strategies sometimes are, you know, evidence-based and that's, that's fine. They need to know which strategies can be productive. But the most important thing, and that's, I think, what the expert teacher is different from the beginning teacher or the less expert teacher, is, the, is knowing what to do when and in which context. Because as an ex, a classroom situation is not predictable. That's why teaching is so inherently complex. It's never the same. Kids ask different questions. The, the situation in the, in the classroom at you know, Thursday afternoon is different from, from, from Wednesday morning. All those subtle differences make out that you cannot just do what you always do. You have to be flexible. You have to respond to what's happening in the moment. Of course, you plan your lessons as good as you can, but even then, there's a lot of, and that's what an expert teacher is able to do to address and to, to change on the spot. So for that particular kind of expertise, there is a term that we in teacher education use and that we um, in our research have used, pedagogical content knowledge, first introduced by <coughs> Professor Lee Shulman from Stanford in the 1980s. And that's his definition there from the mid 80s. And I highlighted, that's my italics, their special form of professional understanding. So that is knowledge that teachers develop. And that is something that sometimes they develop on their own, but of um, uh, sometimes also they share with their colleagues. And, and I like those two questions at, at the end of this slide because in a nutshell, that, that's, that sets the, the science teacher or the physics teacher in this case apart. That, that's why this person has unique expertise that is different from a physics expert, but also different from somebody who teaches another subject. And that, of course, has ramifications. You cannot obviously uh, have a history teacher teach physics. But it's also, of course, uh, limited in what you can do uh, with teachers who are, may, may not have a physics degree, um, 
but teaching physics because th there's nobody else to teach it. So teachers need to develop their expertise. They need to develop this, this special pedagogical content knowledge. And of course, that's what we try to do in teacher education programs. But those programs necessarily only lead to a particular starting point, which, of course, when we give them a diploma, they should be able to start teaching and as, a, as a competent novice teacher. And what we want them to do, and that's why I put up this uh, slide, this diagram, shows that there's two sides to it that need to develop. Every teacher, like every professional, needs routines to develop. That takes time, but you, you get better at it. You need to know your, your, your basic stuff. But at the same time, you need to move along that other axis. You need to innovate. You need to change. As I said, teachers, teaching is never the same. Kids change. And, and what you, even if the physics is the same or the chemistry is the same, the, the context is different. Um, you want to include new content. You want to include new pedagogies. So there's always the balance between developing both that innovation domain as well as the efficiency domain. So beginning teachers may be I don't know if this works, somewhere where the word optimal is, and you want them to move up to, the, to, uh, to become what we call adaptive experts. And we will continue on this positive note now that I give back to Mandy Thanks. for the final section. Thanks. Yeah, for those of you who are following along, section five is the last section, so we're, we're nearly done and we're... Um, hopefully sending you away, uh, sending you into the discussion uh, with some positive ideas. So going back to um, Nicole Mockler and Jan uh, had that slide up about Nicole's amazing work analysing the media, let's change the PR around teaching. What are we going to do? We need to change the PR around teaching. So the times in which we're hearing the teachers, the people of teaching um, being disparaged or the media or around us, then all of us in the room, online, we can have a responsibility to start to push back about that and to think about how we can represent teachers and teaching in ways that are much more positive and accurately representing um, the situation for teachers. And I note there's about to be released um, a campaign, I think it's a national campaign called Be That Teacher. So there's various um, videos that are being released around um, vignettes of teachers who are doing interesting and amazing work with their students and to inspire people to come into teaching. So take Nicole's message with you when you leave here today. So what do, teach, what do science teachers need? Well, many things, and we're not being arrogant enough to say what science teachers actually need, but making some suggestions around what might make aiming higher something that we can all realise. Well, first of all, people talk about having professional development and resources, and of course, professional development and resources are important. However, what we often see, especially at the moment, is the kind of professional development that is happening in a lot of schools comes from mandates to do certain things with all teachers, so it becomes a kind of one size fits all, doesn't matter what stage of your career that you're at, because we all have to do something around X. And the time that people have for professional development then starts to dwindle and teachers have busy lives. So in order to be able to have that opportunity for professional development that kind of hits where you are in your career and what it is that you're interested in developing is less and needs to be paid more attention to. Um, this is not a map of the infrastructure of Victoria, <laughs> of the new train system, for instance, but what it is, it's a draft copy of the resources that are going to be, that are available to STEM teachers for teaching STEM in Victoria. So can you imagine being a beginning teacher, having a look at something like this and saying, hmm, what shall I choose to do? So this is not to, I mean, it is being a bit disparaging about this, but on the other hand, we can say, isn't it amazing? There are so many fantastic resources up there. When you look at this map from universities, from awards and competitions, workshops and events, holiday programs, etc., there is so much. Tech school, of course, tech schools. I did mention tech schools before. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so how do you start to make sense of that as a teacher and making some choices depending on 
where you are, like are you a regional or rural school, what kind of kids are you working with, and have some kind of way in which you can interpret that map that might be helpful for you and knowing, you know, what to access when and what costs things uh, occur with different um, approaches as well. So resources are great, professional learning is great, but we need to think about it in ways that are going to be helpful for teachers. Um, what are some other things that teachers need? So opportunities for trying things out and for things not to work all of the time. And we hear stories from teachers who feel nervous about trying different approaches in their classroom because the principal might be walking down the corridor and hear the kids being very loud or doing things that they don't want to necessarily feel like they got the class out of control or maybe concerns about parents, etc. So teachers need that kind of opportunity to to experiment with things in their classroom, obviously thoughtful experiments, um, but and have time to evaluate and reflect on the work that they're doing. Ideally, they're doing it in collaboration with others, and that collaboration might be happening with teachers in their own school, it might be happening with teachers in other schools, it may well be happening um, with people working in um, different um, centres, for example, I'll put a plug in for the tech schools again here, and, um, and also, um, other kinds of resources, museums, um, and there's many other different kinds of ways in which those collaborations can happen that enable teachers to be able to learn together and to find out about some of those things that we talked about before in terms of contemporary cutting-edge science, for instance. Opportunities to engage in research. Of course, not everybody wants to engage in research, but there are ways in which teachers become interested in learning more about what's happening in their own classrooms or their schools. And that's not necessarily saying formal research, but it could be some ways in which action research projects get developed or investigating students' views about various things. It could be about collaborating with other teachers or universities or, again, some of those other um, science centres, etc., to learn more and to think more about how the, the science that they're teaching helps their students' learning. And um, support and facilitation. We can say all of these things, but if a school limits the ways in which teachers are able to develop themselves, then obviously that um, discourages people um, from reaching out and starting to think about some of those. So school leaders and colleagues. And we put this um, last dot point in as a bit of an interesting provocation that maybe we can talk about in a discussion as well. Relief from tasks that others can do. AI, for instance. So you might be thinking about the ways in which AI can be supportive, um, not necessarily about just producing a whole set of lesson plans that everybody's going to use and you don't have to do that anymore. But what are the ways in which maybe AI might be interesting in helping diagnose student learning difficulties or coming up with different approaches to address where students are in their learning. And um, we're seeing more and more um, AI developing in the field of education. And I think it's important that we consider the ways in which we can harness that kind of technology to support teachers to maybe um, reduce some of those things that are maybe um, noise in their environment or that can be also um, supporting them to learn more about what's going on in their classroom without taking away that professional decision making that is the specialist expertise of the teacher. <clears throat> so ways forward and I think we've talked about um, some of these uh, already so it's probably just a revisiting that notion of being able to use the curriculum flexibly um, and we're hearing more and more stories about um, pre-service teachers going into schools where everything's already set, they can't design any lesson plans themselves because everybody in year nine is doing exactly the same thing because that makes it equitable. Um, and uh, so just learning how to be more responsive and flexible with those, um, the curriculum giving students opportunities for choices. And those can be smaller choices or larger choices depending on levels of confidence um, and what kind of opportunities. Jan talked, more, Jan talked before about um, you know, less stuff and more focus on big ideas. We've got a crowded curriculum. How do we distill the essence of that into some big ideas that you explore compared with covering a whole, a whole range of um, content? And and of course, this is already happening in schools about the, that shifting the culture around um, telling people what they need to know um, compared with giving students the opportunity to learn and question and investigate for themselves. 
Um, and how to make science teaching more attractive. Well, those scholarships that have been announced, we're hoping will have some impact on um, student uh, uptake of science. Let's hope it's the kind of people that we want to come into teaching who are taking up those scholarships. And um, I think also going back to that PR notion, how do we start to value teachers for their specialist expertise? These are not just people who've walked in who are good at maths or physics or biology. These are people who understand teaching and we need to say, and we have a colleague in the US, Marilyn Cochran Smith, who says, it's not rocket science. It's actually much more complex than rocket science. So we, we need to really value that and talk about that complexity uh, in a way that recognizes it as good, not um, debilitating. And that idea of professional space, how do teachers get the space to collaborate, to think, to try things out, to evaluate and reflect, give them space. And that's not just about resources and time, it's the space with each other um, that's important. And perhaps as a final message there, let teachers focus on the students and their learning and appreciation of science. So we appreciate very much your attention and, uh, and we look forward to um, discussing these ideas with you and our panel, so thank you. We clearly need more than a couple of hours for this, but, uh, um, but uh, let's, let's see if we can progress. Um, I've, you've set my head spinning, I've already got lots of questions and I don't want to ask, ask any questions later, I want everyone else to and I want you to have a good conversation. Um, can I now invite uh, Brenda uh, sitting down and can I introduce you to both of our additional panellists. Uh, firstly to Alex uh, Abela, the President of the Science Teachers Association is with us tonight. Thank you for organising with us this, uh, this session, Alex. Um, uh, throughout her teaching life, Alex has held a variety of uh, leadership positions in education and she's currently Assistant Principal and Head of Staff Development at Marion College in Ararat. Uh, she's passionate about uh, organisational culture, innovation and change management and she's uh, driven to create cultures of support, wellbeing and inclusion in all facets of education. Um, she is a director of the Centre for Strategic Education and deputy president of the Independent Education Union of Victoria and Tasmania. And if you still doubt her commitment to the future of her profession after all that, Alex has <laughs> driven all the way down from Ararat this afternoon and she's driving back tonight. Yes. Uh, so we'll... Uh, to resume your place, teaching yeah. duties, such as such as science science teachers, please. So you've made her welcome already. And then uh, Dr. Brendan Rigby is the director of uh, tech schools and performing arts at the Department of Education. Really, um, I'll explore that if I can, Brendan. The <laughs> science arts thing is it something uh, for your information? That Royal Society, and I've made a couple of notes about that. So 1660 scientific method. We go back 330 years or whatever it is. Uh, that Royal Society is about um, the pursuit of natural knowledge. So it doesn't. Dis it, it's not just about science like this joint. We've got to get out and other arts communicators and work out other ways of doing science and presenting it as well. So I'm really want to explore that if we may. Brendan was the project director responsible for the redesign of the framework for improving student outcomes. He's previously worked in international education policy and programs for UNICEF Ghana and Plan International, while also co-founding and managing a non-profit called YDEV, focused on improving support for international development and foreign aid workers. He's a trained secondary school teacher and passionate about embedding student voices and perspectives in education policy. To welcome to you too, Brendan. Um, so I, I've, I've been thinking about Joseph Banks, believe it or not, in all of this, uh, educated to about year 10, in the SES space, had lots and lots of money. Um, so he sort of managed to become the president of that Royal Society, which is a kind of a different path. So, and I've got some questions about it. But firstly, Alex and Brendan, just some reflections on Mandy and Jan's presentation. A lot to digest, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very, um, it resonates very strongly. Um, in my role as the head of staff development at, at Marion College, I see this lived out every day. Um, you know, I have conversations with my colleagues on a daily basis and they 
have been career teachers for 30 plus years and some have been in the profession for five years and then there's, there's everyone in between. There are teachers who are teaching out of field. In fact, in regional rural Victoria, there are more teachers teaching out of field than there are in. Um, and, and my school isn't really any exception. We have staffing challenges that we're grappling with right now. Um, and so it, it, our conversations always come back to, to celebrating what we do. I'm, I'm a glass half full kind of girl. I'm an mm. eternal optimist. I've been teaching for 30 years, so I guess you have to be, to be in the profession for that amount of time and still feel invigorated to walk through the door and work with young people. But yeah, I think the complexity is, is what we really need to hero. And teachers can be their own worst enemies in that regard. They don't talk themselves up enough, Mandy, when it comes mm. to that PR piece. And um, and I think partly that's because teachers are a little shy and retiring and really invested in their work and really don't see themselves as having a role to play in that regard. Um, and that shouldn't be a new idea to the Royal Society of Victoria, should it? I mean, we've got countless examples of scientists throughout the ages who haven't seen their roles as, as being science communicators, you know, to be dispassionate, to, to quote Marie Curie and the like. So um, I think we need to shift the dial a bit, don't we, in that regard? And my role is a very privileged role. It's, it's one which I only took up this year. I um, was born and bred in Melbourne. Uh, I was teaching in independent schools, you know, for the past 29 years in various roles and, and now find myself in a really fantastic community, a really interesting, rich, diverse community with, you know, the SES issue also resonated for me today. And uh, I'm so glad, Jan, that you, you shed light, further light on the PISA data. Mm. It's not all that depressing, is it? But mm. there's work to do and there's mm. work to do where I live and work now. And to me, that's exciting. Um, Did you have a special science teacher at school? Um, yeah, I did. I had a I lot did. of special science teachers. Yeah. yeah. Mr. McCander. Yeah. My chemistry Mrs. teacher. Smith. Mrs. Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Taught me about fossils. Got me. Yeah. 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 In, oh. in year eight. Yeah. And what did you love about the way Oh, that she was Mrs. prepared Smith. to talk to me and, and she, she was prepared to try and follow where my brain was going and where my interests were. Yep. And she and really just cultivated me in little ways. Just, oh, here's something I had at home. Here's a fossil of a, mm. a psychiatry, well, you know, something. And, oh, that's not. Nice. Thank you for that. And it's just that little bit of stuff mm. that just kicks you along. It's really interesting. And I find a lot of, yeah. lot of people in science have, there's that, been that one person that's just noticed, mm. oh, I just might assist if I can. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Brendan? So I have a confession, I'm not a science teacher and yeah. I might work in the science space in terms of the tech schools initiative and supporting the, the STEM centres as well that we have, but you know, I am a trained teacher, but I did want to be a scientist when I was in high school. You know, I wanted to be a paleontologist right. and then I wanted to be an archaeologist and I went and studied archaeology at uni, but then I discovered you needed science to do archaeology. You know, it's less of an arts and humanities degree, it's actually more of a really scientific yeah. Yeah. discipline. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> so. Um, I became uh, a teacher, but I have taught out of field. You know, I have taught mathematics to students. <laughs> um, it was not a good experience for them. Uh, it was very good for me. Yeah. But, you know, it, this topic really resonates with me because I, I was a teacher, but I was one of those teachers that dropped out within the first three years. I left the profession very soon. I'm still in education, but certainly not in the classroom. And I'm also a new father, a first-time father. I have a 12-week-old daughter yeah. uh, at home. Thank you. I don't think she's watching. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I've already bought her those Chris Ferry ABC books, you know, like ABCs of um, neuroscience, the ABCs of space. I, I'm reading her, though. She's not that interested. She's more You're interested in the... You're science teacher. Yeah, I'm You're trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm still teaching other fields. So I'm, she's more interested in, like, the pop-up animal books, but uh, we'll get there. Um, but look, we do have an amazing opportunity in Victoria because, as, as you said, unlike any other state or any other jurisdiction in the world, I think, the 18 STEM centres we have, this network, so you've got the six science and math specialist centres, yeah. 10 tech schools, you've got Kiosk, you know, the Knox Innovation Opportunity in, uh, Science Centre in One Turner, and the STEM Centre of Excellence in the Melbourne University. You know, 18 STEM centres that offer this sort of wraparound support to their local schools, which is 
in comparison, not offered anywhere else. And what we're discovering about those centres is that this sort of ecosystem that students are, are within in their local community, the sort of learning experiences they're getting supported by tech schools, supported by the STEM centres, you know, is, is, is an opportunity that we need to take more advantage of because the sort of things that are happening within the classroom, you think about the SES factors that, that mm. you know, can determine whether or not a student will go on uh, to reach their potential. You know, those can't necessarily always be broken down by teachers. We already ask so much of them. To then ask them to bridge that uh, equity divide is, is, is a huge ask. But there are other things that we can do. And I think these learning experiences that students can access outside mm. of the classroom that support and complement the curriculum yeah. are hugely important. And, and we're just starting to see those ways that, that uh, tech schools in particular are you know, impacting on those things. And, you know, the Victorian government, I, I have to say, uh, has, you know, further doubled down on that investment and uh, this year in the budget, $116 million to build six new tech schools by 2026, which is fantastic. Uh, two in regional Victoria as well, one in Wangaratta and one in Warrnambool. I did invite the new minister tonight, actually. It's good. <laughs> he, he couldn't make it. But yeah, no, so fan, fantastic investment there as well. And and, and one, one piece of data I'll share as well, because I, I love all the data that's been presented, and, and maybe we can try and unpack why. But what we see from students going through tech school programs is 40 to 50% of them tell us that they want to pursue further study in STEM. Right. And, and these are not selected students. These are students just from year seven classes, from a year you know, eight science class, from year 10. You know, there's, there's no sort of sampling in them, mm. right? But 40 to 50% say, we want to study mm. further in STEM. So how can we support that back in schools? Mandy, is there comparative data globally? I mean, the uh, US kids or Canadian kids or Chinese kids think the same about in, in terms of the data you presented? Is it, is it, is it a global problem or is it just or uh, is it worse, think, worse in Australia or better in Australia? Or? I think um, certain industrial countries, there are some places where I, I would say probably um, the UK and Canada and USA experiencing similar problems, but not necessarily all countries. And it also depends on well, the curriculum structures and the expectations, um, which might be different in Singapore or China, for, for instance. Yeah, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, studies on attitudes towards science uh, have been conducted for many decades across the world, and and it, it's well, uh, it's not maybe that's a good thing. They're not ranked by country as it, as we do in PISA, so it's hard to say whether you could say that a, if you read a, a paper from another country, it. Oftentimes you read it's like, well, that sounds very similar. Mm, mm. Yeah. And from where I come from in Netherlands, I think a lot of the problems that we talked about today, I could, I could say we have very similar problems sure. in that country, yeah. including shortage of science teachers. Uh, and um, yeah, I was interested you identified the COVID and you know, yeah. perhaps yeah. the anti-vax thing as a yeah. as a negative thing. Was I, I quickly wrote down? Has the the longer term debate about Climate science has that been a negative as well? Has that brought science teachers into question? It, it, have you been able to identify that as a as a negative as well? As in, uh, well, just as a, the debate. I mean, I yeah, sort of yeah, say yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not so much, perhaps. No, I, I'm trying to think of that report from Stanford that I mentioned. Um, um, about uh, misinformation. Yeah, yeah, about misinformation yeah. and 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 how that. Um, but that report is you know, it's probably too early to, to actually reflect on, on data that um, uh, like how students uh, were impacted by COVID. We're actually doing, uh, together with colleagues from Deakin, a, a project at the moment uh, funded by the Invergauri Foundation that looks at how s um, students' attitudes or, or views re regarding science um, uh, have been changed or, or impacted by COVID. So we're currently interviewing year 11 students in a number of schools throughout Victoria, regional and, and metropolitan at low and high SES, uh, year 11 students because they've gone through COVID. So, mm. and they're mature enough to, and, and clever enough to look back on those years in COVID and say, how did mm. that change? You know, like there was some evidence that yeah, many mentioned. Yeah, that was mentioned. a small bit of data around there, that there is that, positive yeah, attitudes. That, yeah, that students, especially girls, have become more interested in science. Mm. 
Mm. because of it was so prominent mm. in the news. But I, we and women it, yeah. representing it in the news too, I yeah. think. Yes, um, yeah. It's an okay. interesting role yeah. modeling yeah. as well. I That's should true. give a plug. We have a new emerging scientist network of um, undergraduate and immediate graduates uh, from universities who have come to us and said, look, um, we spent uh, two-thirds of our degrees in front of a computer screen. We haven't met anybody. Uh, can we please get together and learn mm. and so... So thanks to you guys, some of them will be online uh, watching tonight, um, and that's something I think we should do. Can I? Related to that, I was actually going mm. to connect um, with Alex in terms of my own initial experiences of the Science Teachers Association of Victoria, because I joined as a beginning science teacher, and it was fantastic. And I got to meet other teachers from other schools. It led to collaborations. It led to friendships. And um, I think that's a really important way for teachers to start to be able to come together as a community, science teachers. And so um, I know that there's the conference coming up. Maybe you want to put a, a plug in. But um, I, I really think that that's an important way, you know, just like the emerging scientists, that science teachers can build that community and, you know, amplify some of those things that we're talking about tonight as well. I think you're speaking yeah, Alex's language. Off yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> Which language? Which hat am I wearing? Yeah. Um, Look, yeah, uh, thank you, Mandy. I joined as a pre-service teacher as well and was inspired to do so by the divine Rod Fawns, mm -hmm. um, who remains in my life and is now a member of staff council um, and a very wise council mm -hmm. in, in that regard. Um, so thank you, yeah. Staff serves science teachers from around the country. We're a founding member of the Australian Science Teachers Association along with uh, Stanislaw, so New South Wales. <laughs> Uh, and so we have a voice not only at a state level but also at, at a national level and many, many opportunities for practising teachers to engage, be it in professional learning and quality professional learning. Of course <laughs> I'm going to say that um, because it is. And I really, really want to say, coming back to your point, Brendan, um, about the tech schools and the services that, that they provide, um, I'm not surprised that the kids that go through the tech schools are inspired mm. to take up STEM. We... Mm recently collaborated staff, that is, with the Geelong Tech School mm. to deliver a Leaders in STEM um, conference, which was highly successful, mm. such a wonderful day, face-to-face -face and illustrative of, of what teachers do when they get together. Teachers learning from teachers, mm. and this has been a maxim for staff for many, many years. Like, staff turned 80 this year, so I'd say um, it's been our maxim for 80 years. We... Um, have always prided ourselves on being able to build communities and we've done so with varying degrees of success throughout our long history, but we're energised by that. Mm -hmm. So StavCon's coming up at the Graduate School um, of Education at Melbourne University on the 17th of November, so please do get along. Um, Associate Professor Peter White from Deakin and Professor Russell Teitler are delivering what will be a wonderful keynote address on education fit for the future. Um, and we, we run a series of VCE conferences across all five VCE su subjects in the third week of, of February uh, every year, it's from biology through to enviro, through to, to chemistry, psychology and physics. And many, many other opportunities, Rob. So thank you for that opportunity <laughs> That's okay. to, to plug our stuff. Um, I'm going to open the opportunity for, we've got people, I suspect, online who are going to give us some questions and certainly... There's an AI expert in the audience too, and I just want to pick that up. You, Rich, you're going to get a little bit of a response, and another one here. Let's let, let, and Sid. But first, to your question, oh, uh, Scott. Oh, sorry, Cat. You know, go. Thank you. Sorry, Cat. Hi. Um, I run a data science education charity, and I do a lot of training of teachers. Um, and first of all, I want to thank you so much because as a former teacher, I was nodding my head off the, <laughs> all the way through your presentation, finally someone saying it. Um, but one of the big problems that we know is that um, kids, especially girls, lose interest in science really early. You know, in grade four, grade five, we've already lost them. Um, and you mentioned out of field teaching as a huge issue. And there was a lot about teacher attitudes in secondary schools. Do you know of any research on um, teacher attitudes in primary schools because I wrote a book about STEM education and when I was researching it I looked at the um, the courses that primary school teachers have to take and often they don't have to take any 
yeah. digital technologies and they don't have to take any science and here they are teaching science yeah. without, you know, so, so primary school teachers are out of field by default. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know of any research on that or any, like, just, what are we doing about it? There's, <laughs> been, there's been plenty of research and again, the picture is very similar across the globe, exactly like you said that most primary teachers don't feel very comfortable teaching science. They, many of them never liked science and dropped it as soon as they could and are anxious to teach it in the, so it's, 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 it's in the curriculum in most countries. It is in the curriculum here, but it's uh, very, let me say, like very variable how it is taught. Um, but if you, if, yeah, if you're a generalist teacher and, and science is not your strength or, and not your interest and you can avoid it, that's what most people tend to do. Um, one of the other great initiatives of the Victorian government, I'm not paid by them, but they ha they ran the pr primary maths science specialist program. Mm -hmm. And I, together with Russell Tyler and Peter White, um, um, taught into that uh, the science component. The sad news is we started with, I, I don't know, 50 teachers per year. It went up and then it went down and it in the end, the program is not offered anymore because there are their enrollment uh, was um, was too low. Mm. But it was a fantastic program mm. to really boost the science competence and confidence of of of, uh, and it was a offer to large numbers of teachers. So it was again a, a really mm. good investment across Victoria, yeah, too. across yeah. the across the state. Yeah. yeah, and another interesting point to add to this too is there are now um, STEM specialists in primary schools, or at least you know mm. trying to put STEM specialists yeah. in primary schools which on the one hand is great because it gives kids the opportunity to be able to maybe access some of that um, science, technology, et cetera, knowledge that they, uh, and experiences they might not have. However, we've also found that what happens is that the, the classroom teacher says, great, I don't have to do that anymore. Somebody else will do it. So I think we need to really find ways to bring those people together to learn from each other as well. Yeah. I work with a lot of primary school students um, and teach them science and I'm going to combine my question with a few other questions that have come from online, so this is not just mine. Um, kind of on the back of that, you, you were asking about sort of the, the teacher's perspective with primary school, but if we think of the whole pipeline of foundation to year 12, like it's quite a leaky pipeline. Um, is there anything that we can be doing in terms of STEM initiatives and things? You started to touch on it, but what can we be doing to drive people's interest in STEM already from that young, young age and, and build their literacy at that point so that they're kind of locked in. We've got them. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, ma there's many, many things I suppose you can do. Well, um, I think it's, it's more than teachers and students in schools as well. I think it's parents and communities. Yeah. So we need to be thinking about the messages of, about how parents talk to their, uh, their children, building awareness of... Um, uh, the importance of certain language, opening up opportunities for careers teachers to learn more about the different uh, ways the in which system, people can yeah. engage yeah. and not thinking that if you study science that you have to be a, a scientist, for instance. So, like, I have a little allergy to the pipeline um, metaphor because I'd like to think about something more organic and fluid than that where people are going in and out and taking the benefits of learning about science and STEM, um, for instance, and then being able to a appreciate their world more as, as, as well as... Um, maintaining that interest perhaps from a career point of view. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's many, many initiatives, um, but I suppose it's bringing them together in some kind of coordinated way that doesn't look like the map that I showed for mm. um, that. I was going to ask about the, the that SES nexus that you talked about. There's a, there's the low group that's going to be very hard to get. Mm. Is that presumably in, in a family, that can be, that's a generational thing that we don't, we did no interest in science, really hard yeah. to get into that group there's the cultures develop in families and groups and it's yeah. hard to yeah. break away from yeah yeah that's that, that's that's definitely true and that's why I, I agree with Mandy we need to look at a, a more holistic or comprehensive approach because you can do fantastic things in your even in an uh, uh, in prep or in, in 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 very early primary years but if if it doesn't resonate with what's happening at home, or even worse, where yeah. the parents say, "Well, you know, what, what's that all about?" Mm -hmm. Because they, the parents can connect with it, or d don't have a, uh, then it's it's mm -hmm. it's not it's it's not going to be enough. So mm -hmm. if you do that with very young kids, which I think is important, one way or another, involve the parents, involve the community, yeah. Yeah. and there are some good initiatives. Some great uh, initiatives we'll around that. that. Yeah. 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 Question from Sid Verma, who's our Royal Society. Mm -hmm. 
Council Treasurer and also operates a little organisation called Brainstem. What's that all about, Steve? I know, it must be in the name STEM. Uh, oh, I've got so many questions. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for all that you shared. Uh, I want to preface my question by almost posting a very negative scenario. Uh, we worked so hard over the years to close the gender gap and we saw on some of the slides 51%, you know, almost sort of reaching parity in some slices of, of that continuum. And now there's a new pipeline, assuming we are calling it a pipeline, and I completely agree with you, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ecosystem. Now there's this new pipeline of teacher shortage. Are we recreating the same pipeline all over again? What have we learned from fixing the first leaky pipeline that we are still doing the same thing? It's taken us decades to get to 50%, and here we are again lamenting about the fact that there's another leaking pipeline of teachers not coming into our system or leaving too soon. What can we do differently? Because otherwise, the ones who are in there are doing an amazing job. Yeah. Yeah. And I should point out there's one thing missing from your slides, which is what the teachers don't have is time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because we, we speak with so many of them. Uh, I mean, as I run Brains, I mean, we work with so many schools. And the teachers are just absolutely hammered with yeah. so much uh, that they have to do. If so I, yeah, what can we do I differently in the, with the new pipeline? Offer an obs a, a comment. Um, let's just call it as it is. We're triaging the profession at the moment. Yeah. yeah? Mm. So those statistics bear that up. Um, so what does one do in a crisis when we're administering CPR? Mm. When we've got, um, you know, graduate teachers coming through who are foundering um, because they've not delivered uh, a teaching round in person, they've been on a screen, where the complexity of what it is that we as teachers are required to do is, you know, accelerating um, and, you know, compliance through to child safety, through to NCCD, um, if you teach in a school where you've got, you know, significant numbers of kids from recognised trauma backgrounds, individ individualised curriculum, and, and we're talking about PCK as being core, um, that's where it needs to be. That's where we need to shift things back. That, that was the world that I cut my teeth in, and I feel really privileged to have been able to start my career in a very supportive collegiate environment in a school. So collaboration is key. Um, retaining our young ones um, and getting them to, you know, getting them to that adaptive expert stage should be our aspiration, mm. but it's not looking overly realistic. Mm. And I started out by saying I'm, I'm optimistic, and I am. I am. You have to be. So we, we yeah. need structures. We need systems in place. This is systemic. Yeah. Yep. Um, we need systems in place which privilege teacher knowledge, teacher agency, choice. The curriculum for the time being enables that, but do different um, regulatory bodies enable that? Do, you know, the school's financial bottom line enable that, building that into a teacher's load? At the moment, no. Right? So... The increasing ways of schools representing like, themselves as a competition against each other too. That then yep. puts pressure on what it is that you're expected to do to perform in that environment. Perhaps yep. maybe broadening the definition of a teacher to having enablers, facilitators, because technology is changing, knowledge is changing, knowledge is changing, knowledge is changing, outside world and coming to talk to these students, yep. then we don't have teachers trying to just play catch up with more knowledge because you can get those resources from everywhere else and you know inform uh, the young people with the greatest of respect i disagree i think the teacher needs to be their their pck needs to be privileged okay. and they need to be the creators of the curriculum and interpreters of curriculum and that feeds back into teacher well-being and that also feeds back into teacher self-worth and hopefully those outside of the profession will start to understand the crucial role that, that educators play. Okay. So that's my question. Well, well, the gentleman at the back is going to come back to Kat. Hi, I, I am a science teacher who came into science mid-career okay. and or mid-life, whatever. But one thing that I, that I noticed as a teacher, there seems to be, a, in terms of the curriculum, trying to make it exciting and interesting to the kids, it sort of seems to be driven from the top down. You've got 
students are trying to achieve a, an ATAR to get into a university course. And to do that, you've got to have a set curriculum at VCE, which we need then to prepare students for that set curriculum. That feeds down to the junior years, because we're preparing them for VCE, and all of a sudden everything becomes very regimented. And you just don't seem to have the flexibility to truly be innovative in what you teach. Any comments? I, this, is, this is where tech schools and the STEM centers can play a role and show a different way into the curriculum that schools can't necessarily afford or have the time or resources yeah. to pilot or to test because tech schools are not schools. So, I, you know, we didn't cover this off, but you can't enroll a student there. You can't enroll your child there. The idea is that they serve their local partner schools, offering these immersive, tech-enhanced, you know, inquiry-based learning experiences, maybe across a day, maybe across a few days. But what we're noticing increasingly is uh, an approach where they're not only making sure they complement and enrich their partner school's curriculum, but they're also bringing in industry and getting industry's perspectives on the curriculum and getting industry's perspective on what are the skills that you need for your workforce that you're not seeing students come out of schooling with. And then that goes, that flows back into the partner school with the teachers who are bringing their students out here and their eyes have been opened to a new way, new pedagogical approaches. They're then asking for professional learning from tech schools. And it's not just science teachers, mm. it's arts teachers, it's humanity teachers. Mm. They want these inquiry-based, problem-based, design thinking approaches as different ways yeah. into the curriculum. And then to help with the kind of time constraints and the, and the resource scarcity and the workforce challenges, you know, we've got tech school staff who, to Sid's point, they're not necessarily trained teachers. We only require on site at tech school one VIT registered teacher. A lot of them come from industry. A lot of them come from academia. They are facilitators. But they are working alongside teachers back in the classroom to try and embed these practices and to try and improve their professional yeah. practices. So, some, yeah. so sometimes we need to look outside the black box that can be schools yeah. and yeah. it can yeah. be secondary schools. Yeah. Yeah. And in Victoria, I think we are lucky in that we have these places we can look to mm. to mm. get into the curriculum in different ways. Mm. And I think what you, um, what you highlight is some of the embedded cultures in schools around how things should be too. Yeah. And having um, experiences like tech schools, mm. and I've also seen um, teachers working in quite imaginative ways in senior science classes, but they often are working against the grain. Mm. So is it how, how do you start to change a culture of thinking mm. around what might be possible in senior classes that will still allow you to achieve those ATARs that students are, are, are looking for, even if we could change the ATAR? Yeah, yeah I'm doing, uh, another Can question. I ask a question to the room? Or mm. it? Yep. Yes, yes, yeah. you first. You first. Yep. Hi there. This is this is actually a little bit of a good news. Um, my name is Tim Neve, and I've uh, taught science for over thirty-five years now. And I'm one of those rare people that did physics at uni and now teach physics as well. So there we go. Um, we had a. I come from the Latrobe Valley, and we've come up today. I've been teaching science all day long, so we come up from there with my wife here. Um, We've had a, a unique thing happen in the Latrobe Valley. A company there, just about six months ago, uh, bought a property, a really nice house, plus beautiful grounds. And we got talking to them, and they said, we'd like to do some STEM science here. I said, I'm a science teacher. We'll pay for everything. We'll pay for the busing as well. Oh, so I said, so I've been heading this up for the last uh, six months or so. We're actually running a pilot program now. We've got 40 feeder schools, all primary schools, mm. more Wall Moe Taralgan, and plus the, the surroundings, the, the poorest schools in Victoria, just about poorest areas. So we're pulling grade three, fours, five, sixes in to do STEM science. Um, so I've been putting all the programs together that, and with that, we've got a science teacher there. We've got, um, today we've had, we've opened up beehives for them. They've got oh. the little bee suits on, they come in. We've done, we were doing, um, today we've been doing um, microscopy, I say that, microscopes, <laughs> using microscopes, yeah. <laughs> see I'm a physics teacher, <laughs> um, uh, using microscopes, absolutely fascinated, we bought hundreds of dollars worth of microscopes, they've been doing uh, soil sampling uh, for pH, phosphorus, nitrogen, um, and it's an ongoing program, and it's going to run for the next number of years. We're getting science teachers. Uh, we're going to be training the science teachers in primary schools as well. Uh, we're going to be getting parents in to uh, work along with the kids as well. We're going to be getting older adults in to work along with the kids as well. 
because we have that flexibility. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, it's a good piece of news, isn't it? Because that it's something which is great. It's something which is quite yeah. unique. So we've been doing that. Before before you go, the man that gave you the microphone as the editor of our magazine, Science Victoria, he wants you to write a story about yeah, that for Science awesome. Victoria. Yeah. And because I think we might be able to, I mean, I think there's a bit of enthusiasm here. If we <laughs> learned more about your model, yep. I'm sure it can be replicated, and it sounds like something that we really yeah. could. What we're trying to do is create a spark in those students. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what we do for yeah. grade three, four, five, six, and then yeah. keep that. That's up. what science teachers want to do. Well, yeah, and more generous donors. That would be great. Well, yeah. I, I want to come to re, I want to come to resourcing as we go, uh, and I, but I think we may be able to. Uh, this, other philanthropic support might be able to support that model to be replicated yeah. if we think about it. Okay. And, and can I just ask, yeah. are, you, are you connected into Gippsland Tech School in Morwood? Uh, we visited, yes. And also, uh, we're going to get some um, trainee teachers from Fed Uni to come in Great. to help out as well. So, yeah, we, we've made all those connections. That's, That's fantastic. Cool. Mm, I'm thinking about the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation who are looking for some things to do. So, that might be good. Yeah, and we'll go to your question next and then we'll go to online if that's well, right. it's, yeah. it, it, yeah. it, it when many and I, I mean, it's, it's about that issue of time and workload, and, and there's always a lack of time. And, and we all remember when computers were first introduced, we were promised, oh, those things can do stuff that we don't have to do with. We have much more time. We Well, the truth is, everybody's working harder than ever before. So now with AI, and I haven't ex used AI myself in, in my teaching yet, but I, like one of our ma um, Master of Teaching students last week gave a talk and he was raving about something called magicschool.ai, I've never heard of it, and it can help you write, uh, generate quizzes and rubrics and lesson plans, and it can even help you write templates for emails that you can write to parents. So all those things that take a lot of time, of course you need to, in the end, uh, personalize it and, and make sure that it is, um, but it would save mm. a lot of time. Now, I don't know about your experiences, whether you use AI in schools or in other, mm. but is, is, is that something that could actually tackle that persistent time issue that we, we all the things that we recommend and that we want to do take more time, of course. So we need to find time somewhere because otherwise everybody gets even more yep. overloaded. Yeah, and I'm going to handball your question to one of our Royal Society councillors who, who, my last conversation with him, uh, and he's a uh, digitally, digital sort of person. And his la <laughs> last conversation with, uh, with Rich, Bl Richard Blundell was that in my work, uh, things are changing so fast in AI, by the time we've finished a proposal, it's changed within a month. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any reflections on how we might apply? What, have you look, what are you seeing, Rich, that might sort of apply to even Jan's proposition? Um, I, I would, oh, sorry, Richard Bloodall, I'm an um, associate VP at Cognizant, which is a technology company, but also at the Royal Society. Um, yeah, your, your question, you're absolutely right. Your, your observation, it probably can. Uh, we're seeing lots of sort of applications for it. But um, to, to Rob's point, the, the whole thing is moving so quickly in the yeah. last few yeah. months that, you know, we started writing a paper on it, and by the time mm. we'd finished, it was already out of date. Mm. So, um, yeah, probably uh, wait a few more months, and uh, it'll be even better. Um, I did actually have a question you go. Um, to the guys. I absolutely love the, um, the tube map of all the oh, opportunities. I, I'm going to come to the tube map because I, I want to put those people in a room together. Yeah. You need a big room. Yeah. Of all, of all those opportunities for, um, for kids in Victoria, and it was great to see um, Sid's company on there as well. Um, if so... I did have a look and I didn't notice the Royal Society or our National Science Week on there. So how would we get on? It was a draft copy, like it is not, it was incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, uh, there's, a, there's a point I often make talking to green groups is that we don't do what the Minerals Council do. The Minerals Council's members are Woodside and Fortescue and Rio and they partner up to do things. And part of the role that I see for we, we need to think about this group and so I'm delighted to have Alex and the science teachers now mm -hmm. sitting alongside us here at the Royal Society. We need to work out, I'm right. sort of half joking about putting that group in a room together because that's the way we go to Ben Carroll and say we need to resource this better. Mm -hmm. And we're all in the room together and we're all agreed and you better pay attention. And I think that has to happen at some yeah. level. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, catch one. Yeah, no, I need, yeah. Um, there are some fantastic resources for students, and, and we've discussed them. Tim, was it? Like, that's amazing. Um, also, the text, well, all the specialist schools. I, I'm associated with three, so I feel like I have to say that. But um, <laughs> uh, in terms of support for teachers, like, I'm really thinking about th this comes from three different questions that I'm putting into one mm -hmm. online. Um, how do we really get sort of professional development and support and resources for teachers that are focusing on teaching the new science, getting students hands on and finding those ways to hook them in and draw them in because teachers don't have that time to look at the internet. The internet's great, but it's big. Um, but also in terms of thinking about gender inclusive practices as well, how do we support the teachers with all of that? Sorry, that's a massive question. Join staff. That would be one thing you could do. Yeah. Join a professional association yeah. like the Science Teachers Association of Victoria. Yeah. Um, we also run the Science Talent Search, which is 70 plus years old. Um, and it's, it's a great program which supports teachers to um, hone their practice in inquiry-based learning. And whilst it's not scientific research um, per se, it's, it provides an, a window into the life of a scientist. So if you haven't heard of the Science Talent Search, please get on board. Our presentation day is the 5th of December and anyone can register to come along and it will be online. Um, this is a remarkable example of being able to showcase student initiative. Just while I've got the mic, kudos to our friends from, from Gippsland. Um, our curriculum, curriculum in Victoria is robust enough and flexible enough for us to be able to do this. Yeah. We just need champions such as our friends in the back of the room who have that passion um, to, to engage and to see an opportunity and take it. And we have, yeah, and grab it and run with it. Um, so you're remarkable. And there are, there are many, not to diminish your efforts, but there are many, many heroes around and champions around the state that do that. And if I don't get the mic again tonight, um, <laughs> I'll just say one more thing. The, the curriculum is robust. It's great. We need to find ways to promote, you know, to grow not only our recognised leaders in schools, but those who don't aspire to recognise positions of leadership and to, to value their adaptive capabilities um, and give them critical roles and, and, and agency in curriculum making and to recognise that, and that takes money, I'm afraid to say. A bit of cash holder always helps and a bit of time. So being able to release people to write curriculum is like the holy grail. And always valuing context. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Valuing context. We have um, many very, we've got a great deal of potential out there in the regions in rural Victoria. Mm. We just need investors to hook in with schools and passionate teachers such as your good selves yeah. to take up an opportunity and to, to run with it. Yeah, we'd love to explore that model. Martin's got a question. We've got Where two, you going? Scott, two final there. questions and I will say, because I know there's been a lot of questions about it, but I'll... Uh, with my Science Victoria cap on, I'll make sure I liaise with you guys to make some of the things that you've shared with us tonight available to to that wider audience, because I know there's been questions about some of the resources that you've touched on. Yep. So we'll, we'll talk afterwards about sure that we can share them with the interest of party. Hello, my name is uh, Anne Nicholson, and I am the uh, Dean of the Faculty of IT at Monash University and also a Professor of Computer Science and AI. So sorry, I had to sort of jump in when yes. the yes. AI got mm -hmm. um, yeah. question came up. So I've sort of got well, one direct comment, but then a sort of a comment that I'd like to hear what the panel thinks. So the first is, um, with all due respect, uh, I think waiting a few months <laughs> is not going to work because it will keep changing. And what I would say there is that people have to get started at some point, and there's a lot happening now, but there's also self-organising groups of teachers, and I've seen a Facebook group that popped up and things. So I would just encourage everyone not to wait until somehow it all settles down, because I think then um, it'll just keep zooming past you. It's a bit like if you didn't get an iPhone at a certain stage, it gets harder to <laughs> join in and use apps later. Um, and tying into that though, and I just want to hear what your thoughts is, maybe it's more for the secondary school teaching, but we certainly see it at university. Let me tell you, these students are using chat GPT and AI. So I would encourage all teachers, partly for your own practice and efficiency, but just because we're in a world now where our students are going to be using that technology there's a bit of an arms race on the what we call student integrity at the uh, university level, but it's you know plagiarism, cheating, whatever you want to call it. 
Um, and this is going to be the world, and I don't want it all to be a negative. We are going to be creating um, citizens who are going to be in all their forms of work, including science, going to be using AI to help them do science better, data-driven, data science, AI better, um, in all fields of endeavours. And so sort of we, I would just really say that I am encourage people to be positive because there's some very negative aspects of AI and how it's used and bias and all those things. We won't get into it, but... We, we're not going to stop it, so I want us to put our effort into the positive bits yeah. of it and just really wondering how you're seeing that in your space because we're seeing it in the university sector and it's a challenge for us. Thanks. Who wants to start? Quickly up and down. What are you doing, Brendan? AI. In, in the techs? Yeah. Personally, I'm not doing anything, but, I mean, tech schools are already responding to this in sort of the program offerings, and, and they're, I think, always a bit ahead of the curve. You know, yeah. they've been offering, you know, cybersecurity and cybersecurity-related programs for some time now. You know, they're already in that space. In the AI, they're already offering programs, teaching learning programs to students in that space, because they can do that. You know, school, yeah. secondary schools may not be able to be that uh, adaptive and flexible to respond to those things, but, yeah, there's... Uh, some amazing communities of practice of teachers that are opening up and, and they're really rich and, and how do we support those um, self-organising organic means of teacher professional practice. Um, but I think for the tech schools it's, it's that ability just to be flexible and then for schools to see those examples and to try and build those practices back in their school, if yeah. they can. Mm. Sounds like another alliance, Alex. Mm. Um, I want to finish, I think we should, in fairness to our panel and speakers, finish at eight, and we have a vote of thanks to give. So a question from Martin. We may have time for another short one. Um, yes, sir? I'd like to uh, congratulate Alexandra and the Science Teachers Association for the programs that they run, in particular, the Science Time Search. And I just, uh, I'd like to tell a little story, uh, my own experience. Several years ago, I was invited to be a, a judge for Science Time Search and came across a student who's absolutely brilliant. Um, I kept in touch with him over the years and he went and in fact employed him while he was at university as, as a vacation student. And as soon as he graduated, I employed him full time. He was a key member of a group that uh, he developed the all electronics, a very complicated um, medical device, which was brilliant, that, which confirmed his, his talents. I sometimes think that um, <laughs> Maybe it's more encouragement um, of, of industry to come along to the science town searches yeah. might be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Good. That gave me goosebumps. Thank you very much. Um, our executive director, Joanne Phillips, is here today, and I'm sure she would love to hear... I would talk to all the industry. <laughs> <laughs> and all of your science talent search legacy stories as well. Um, it's, it's such a wonderful, affirming community. Um, I had the great pleasure of attending uh, Judging Day at MLC in July and, you know, I circulated around the groups of parents with their children. They were so proud. They were telling me about their, their posters and their scientific inventions and their models and um, we came across parents who had themselves um, been participants in Science Talent Search and were bringing their own mm -hmm. children along mm -hmm. and were so proud. Um, it, it's a it's a beautiful piece, a cultural piece in, in Victoria's science education community. So thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, it really warms my heart. On that positive note, I'm now going to conclude the questions. Um, very positive note. Thank you, Martin. That's a good, good story. Thank you. Uh, and call on Professor Sandra Kentish. Uh, Sandra is a fellow of the Academy of Technology and Engineering and she is the chair of the Victorian Division of the Academy. I call on Sandra to pass a vote of thanks to, on behalf of the organisers. Thank you, Rob. And look, I just found that absolutely awe-inspiring. I really enjoyed all the presentations. I think there were some very negative messages, but also some really positive ones. And so I really want to thank all the speakers. Um, two things resonated for me in particular. The first was that message about getting the PR around teachers need to change. And that's certainly something I'll take home. The other more broader message is I teach, and, and I know other people in the audience too teach, I teach science at a tertiary education level, or STEM, 
at a tertiary education level. And a lot of the messages you mentioned about primary and secondary school teaching also resonate mm -hmm. when you get to that tertiary level. Uh, but I think the other message that comes through is what Rob brought up, that we should somehow put together the combined resources of S STAV, mm. uh, the tech schools, mm. uh, the Royal Society of Victoria and the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, and perhaps we should be putting together some sort of a policy document mm. towards yeah. the, uh, the state government um, in time for the next election uh, that, that might perhaps address some of the, the, the more practical issues that the, the teachers are facing. So, uh, so yes, can I, in, in summary, thank all our speakers, uh, Amanda Berry, Jan Van Driel, uh, Alexandra Abella and Brendan Rigby for all their time, uh, effort tonight. So thank you. Thank you.